Thank you. Welcome to the Board of Education of Queen Anne's County Open Session Meeting for Wednesday, October 5th, 2022. I'd like to call this meeting to order. May we please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all very much. At 4.30 this evening, the Board of Education uh, went into closed session. Pursuant to the General Provisions Article 3-305 and 3-104, the Board of Education met in closed session to discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom this public body has jurisdiction and any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals, to consult with counsel to obtain legal advice, to consult with staff, consultants, or other individuals about pending or potential litigation, and to conduct collective bargaining negotiations or consider matters that relate to negotiations. A few housekeeping items that we have. Do I have a motion to accept the agenda as presented? Motion to approve the agenda as presented. Second. Second. Any questions or comments on the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote on the motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. We have the approval of September 21st, for tw September 21st, 2022 closed session. Move to approve the minutes. Closed session. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any questions or comments? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Approval of the minutes for the open session of September 21st. Move to approve the minutes from the open session. Second. Thank you. Motion second. And all those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. We now have our award presentations. I'd like to turn this over to Dr. Salins. Yes, if we can move down. Usually we start off with a different award, but today we have some amazing students that I'd like to call up here um, and recognize uh, for their efforts and their achievements as it relates to College Board. So Ken Allen High School and Queen Anne's County High School students have qualified for three of College Board's recognition programs. These awards are National African American Recognition Program, known as NAARA, the National Hispanic Recognition Program, known as NHRA, and the National Rural and Small Town Recognition Program, known as R, excuse me, NRSTA. These programs award academic honors to unrepresented students. Sophomores and juniors are scored eligible if they score in the top 10% on the PSAT slash NMSQT or the PSAT 10 within program by state in the eligible exam periods. Sophomores and juniors are also score eligible if they score a three or higher on two or more distinct AP exams in the eligible exam periods. A very well-deserved congratulations to these very hardworking students. In the category of NAARA is Lyric Jordan, who was not able to be here, but our very own student board representative, Makai Johnson. Makai's family's here. I know they're taking pictures. We're going to ask them to come up so they can get some great pictures with us, too. So please come forward. In the next category, which was the NHRA, we have Isabella G Gamaz, who is not able to be here, but we'd like to recognize her. In the next category, which is the NRSTA, we have Anne Marie Thomas. I believe she's here this evening. No. Elise Tellson. Emma Lynn Dumont. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. 
We're going to continue. We have a couple more. Yes, yeah, please, please do come up. And we have, we have Catherine Hall. We also have Samuel Toole, who is one of our board members. And last but not least, we have Zoe Crawford, who I don't believe was able to be here this evening. But a huge round of applause for these students. actually have one more additional recognition. So I'd like to have Luke Meisel, I believe I said that right, I hope, Meisel. and his family. Is it Meisel. Meisel and his family, please come forward. So this is a first in my career. I've been doing this 31 years, but we have a student here, Luke, who has actually received a superior score on the AP Computer Science exam. Oh, it gets better. Listen, Luke's performance, it does. It's incredible. So Luke's performance on the AP Computer Science A exam in May of 2022 was so superior that it falls into a rather select category. AP exams are scored on a scale of one to five, as we all know. Luke not only received the top score of a five, but also was one of only 369 students in the world wow. to earn every point possible on the AP computer science exam. <laughs> wait to see what all of these students are going to do because all amazing accomplishments so congratulations if I can get everyone in can I get you to scoop back just a couple I'm sorry I'm gonna get everyone in thank you all right look this way please thank you Now we're going to move on to our normal recognitions and we're going to start off with the Energizer Bunny. This award is given to staff member or volunteer who keeps on going. It is sponsored by Bayview Financial who's here this evening, Mr. Cliff Birdingham and Mr. Wayne Humphreys. Thank you gentlemen for being here. Our September Energizer Bunny is Mac Lucan from Churchill Elementary School. If he'll please come forward as well as his principal, Susan Walber. And I believe we have our teacher of the year here as well, if she could come up. See, I put her right on the spot. I <laughs> so Miss Miss Walbert says that Matt has been working alone in the evening since June. He took great ownership of our building this summer, and because of this ownership and hard work, we had a clean, shiny building ready for our Cubs on day one. He worked late hours and weekends to get it done. Matt deserves this shout out and many more. He is an important part of our team. But don't take my word for it, Susan says. Listen to what his staff has to say about him. Matt never hesitates to ask how he can help us. No matter how much he has to do, he'll always find time to help. Kudos to Matt for holding down the fort while Tim was recovering from surgery and while Churchill Elementary School was short-staffed. Matt is amazing. He has stepped up and put in extra time to do what needs to be done. He gets things done and done well. Matt goes above and beyond for all of our unified arts teachers. He provides support, ensures we all have what we need, and he does it with a smile. We are so happy to have Matt on our team. Matt is always happy to help, no matter the situation. He was the only custodian this summer, and in addition to cleaning other schools, completed most of the cleaning of our school by himself. He worked many weekends to ensure our school was ready for our Cubs on day one. We we appreciate the dedication Matt has for Churchill Elementary School. Matt helped us locate, move, and adjust furniture with a smile on his face to ensure our Cub Hub was ready for our Cubs. He also went through at least three different wrenches to try to help with those fussy <laughs> table heights. <laughs> Matt has risen above and beyond to ensure our Judy Center is always ready for our families. So again, congratulations, Matt. Task with all of 
all the wonderful comments from the staff. Okay. Um, okay. Yep, I can't see. Up on the step. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Ready? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next is our Shining Star Award. This award recognizes someone in our school system who shines. Our October Shining Star is Melissa Lawler from Centerville Elementary School. And with her is her principal, Mrs. Teresa Farnell. So Mrs. Farnell writes, Ms. Lawler at Centerville Elementary School is the IEP chair and case manager for our second grade special education students. She works in partnership with her special education team to problem solve and meet all needs of our students through doing what is best for our students. She also works most collaboratively with her general education teachers. She routinely plans and co-teaches with them each and every day. While working on her endless to-do list, she maintains a positive attitude and promotes teamwork. She is a true team player and works together with all staff for the success and growth of the students at Centerville Elementary School. She is indeed a shining star for Centerville Elementary School. Award, award for this evening is our Spirit Award. This award is given to an individual or individuals who embody the spirit of Queen Anne's County Public Schools. This um, award is nominated by Mr. Michael Bell. I'd like for him to come up, please. And our October Spirit Award winners are all of our service learning coordinators, and I'd like all of those that are represented tonight to please come forward. And our two art department chairs, please. Yeah. <laughs> He's cute. Oh my goodness. Cute as a button. So what began with a Service Learning 101 roundtable at the second annual Civic Education and Engagement Leadership Summit last April, where Supervisor Michael Bell delivered a national presentation on many of our high quality service learning projects that take place here in Queen Anne's County, had led to Queen Anne's County Public School being named the winner of the 2022 Harris Wolford Common Good Award in and of itself. Congratulations on that. This national award is the highest honor Youth Service America gives each year, and it carries significant prestige since it is named after one of our nation's greatest public servants. The award was created to honor those who do extraordinary work for the common good and help make that the common expectation for every young person in America. Tonight, we celebrate all of our service learning coordinators across the district in grades four through 12 who help us integrate high quality service learning projects for all students within our classrooms in addition to two high school art department chairs who have involved their national honor societies in meaningful service projects that impact our local communities in extraordinary ways. We would like to thank all of our teachers and our service learning coordinators whether you could make it out this evening or whether you're here with us this evening and the Youth Service America for this honor. Congratulations to all of you.
while the room is uh, clearing out, I'd like to um, congratulate our two student board members again. It was very good job. <laughs> For another month or two, we'll be trying. We'll see you next month. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Get his name in there. There we go. Smile. I am so proud of Love it. <laughs> They're not proud at all. That's awesome. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Good Thank you. All Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Okay. Uh, board involvement. Ms. Bennett. I'm sorry. Oh, yes. Um, well, I did attend the community's uh, town hall and safety discussion that they had at the Kramer Center last week, um, and it was really amazing. They had uh, a great panel of folks from um, Mr. Saboro to Gary to Dr. Um, to Sheriff Hoffman, sorry, to Dr. Salins. But, you know, I wish more people had shown up, but the 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 people who did come, the community that did come, had some great questions, great um, suggestions, really involved. So, um, you know, I'd encourage you that we're gonna be doing another one in the spring, I think we said, and that to go out, because it was really good information and they really want to hear from you. So that was nice. Mr. Schiffinelli? Well, I'll give a shout out to uh, Southersville Middle School. They've got their uh, Hispanic Heritage Celebration coming up October 21st and uh, from 5.30 to 7.30 to wrap up Hispa Hispanic Heritage Month. And um, unfortunately, I can't make it and I would really love to go. I'd lived in Central and South America for like four and a half years and I went out to the El Salvadoran uh, celebration earlier this month or in September in uh, Gaithersburg. And uh, between the food, and then it rained, and then the sun came out, and it got really hot and humid, and I started feeling really homesick <laughs> for uh, Central America. But um, anyway, uh, good stuff. Shout out to the principal there. And uh, that's it. Ms. Ben? Um, so I, uh, I've been working with one of our parents. We have two um, fundraisers going on for our CTE programs. One is for the auto mechanics group, and the other one is for the welding group. So um, contact me if you want some information on how you can help bring in some tools for our students to complete their certifications in those two programs. Thank you. I'd just like to remind everyone that uh, October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Um, just remind our, our daughters and nieces um, to get checked. It's very important. Uh, our student board members, I will start with Mr. Toole, Queen Anne's County High School. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, so my mom's left, so I feel like a lot of pressure has been lifted off of me. <laughs> I no longer have to like impress anybody. So, all right, so starting out our calendar for October, on the 12th, we have PSAT testing in the morning for sophomores and pre-registered juniors. Uh, the 13th, we have underclassmen picture makeup day for student IDs, as well as a financial aid night at 5.30 in the auditorium. Uh, the 25th, we have the Performing Arts Department, and they are hosting the Fall Pops concert at 7.30 p.m. in the auditorium. Uh, the 27th, we have National Honor Society inductions at 5 p.m. And guess where? The auditorium. <laughs> um, the 28th, uh, we have an announcement to all seniors and their families. Jocelyn's will be at our school during lunch shifts to take class ring and cap and gown orders. Packets are available in the front office. Uh, as well as Chesapeake College dual enrollments will be meeting with the students at 9, 10 a.m. in the cafeteria. If you plan to dual enroll in the spring, please sign up uh, in Aviance. Another important announcement, uh, schools are closed October 21st and 31st for professional development, and college administration representatives will be visiting our school throughout the month. Sign up on Naviance. 
as far as sports goes, which is the more important part about this, <laughs> uh, we have three undefeated teams. Football, field hockey, and volleyball with 5-0, uh, 6-0, and 7-0. Mm -hmm. And then in our other varsity sports, we have boys soccer 5-2, girls soccer 6-2, and golf with four wins. Uh, overall, we're doing much better than Ken Island is. <laughs> and I hope that they're ready October 28th for the football game. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Johnson from Ken Island High School. Uh, first things first, uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening. The top news of our school is that our stadium is finally open, reopened. The track is finally finished. Yay. The track is being of a uh, very high quality, very durable material, and it's, it's guaranteed to, to uh, stand the test of time. And um, to kick off the opening of the stadium, we had our first marching band competition in, the, in 12 years. Uh, from what I understand, the host team does not compete in the competition, so they aren't ranked as first, second, or third, but they did still perform, and it was a nice turnout. Um, then we had our first home game of the year, September 30th, last, fr last Friday, and we won that against Y High. Mm -hmm. I think the greater challenge was the weather more so than the team. And, um, and congratulations to Mr. Sofa on his 100th win of his, of his uh, career. Um, as well as also on last Friday, we had a clubs and activities fair during lunch. This provided students with another opportunity to see what clubs were available as well as present new ideas for clubs. It was a great turnout. About five to 600 kids showed up and most of them did sign up for something. Uh, whether or not they'll stick to what they signed up for is unknown. <laughs> However, they were able to be exposed to these clubs and activities. Um, some students also in even introduced uh, outdoor and hiking club as well as a gaming club. So this, those are just a few of the new ones on the list and a few upcoming events we have spirit week which is going to kick off october 17th with the senior sunrise and breakfast um and we also have the pep rally and dance on thursday september 20th and the game on september september the 20 no october i'm sorry october, october. september over. october the 22nd against bennett on saturday and of course we have the upcoming game against qa which will be <laughs> a real showdown and i'm sure we'll get you <laughs> No competition. <laughs> and that's, the, that's everything I have. Ken Island is, what is theirs? Oh, oh I'm, I'm not exactly sure. Oh, but okay. I believe her, we may be, yeah, I'm not exactly sure. I believe we only lost we one game, which was yeah. the first game. Thank you so much. Dr. Salins? I'm segueing right into it. It's okay. No worries, no worries. Um, actually, have just concluding opportunities to be out in the schools with our secondary groups, um, superintendent advisory um, members, and just some great feedback from our students, a great kickoff to the new year, and some successes that they're already having. Um, so I think that that's probably my biggest highlight. Um, obviously, I've had an opportunity to engage in a lot of the evening things that are going on and back in the swing of things, but I would say that being with the kids in the classrooms is really highlight for me too so great thank you uh, dr sprinkle spotlight presentation i have to tell you this has been one of my favorite things to watch this okay. whole year good evening vice president harper dr salins board members, executive team members. I am Marcia Sprinkle for the record, assistant superintendent, and I have the pleasure of presenting the September Spotlight. So I'm excited to do that tonight. So here we go, starting with Mattapeak Elementary School. Principal Menton reported that the back to school night at Mattapeak Elementary School was a huge success. Um, lots of families came out to the festivities and took part. Mrs. Mitten was thrilled to see so many students and families out. And there you can see pictured there of their back to school night. Next we have Sutlersville Elementary School. The Queen Anne's County Library Bookmobile visited Sutlersville Elementary. Students adjusted nicely, as you can see, to being back in school. You can see them in a nice line there, and <laughs> posing for the camera. Staff showed their spirit throughout the month of September. They also enjoyed Kana ice treats. So congratulations, Sutlersville Elementary School, on a great return. 
<laughs> Next, we have Centerville Elementary School. Centerville Elementary School students also adjusted nicely to being back in school. So there they are, hard at work. We even have a student reader there, pictured up there in the upper right-hand corner. At Mattapique Middle School, they welcome Mrs. Bennett. <laughs> Students also settled back into the routines of being back in school. So congratulations, Mattapique Middle School, for adjusting to being back in school. Centerville Middle School. Centerville Middle School partnered with Queen Anne's local authorities and the emergency services to support students so and staff also. Um, we had some trainings that actually took place, actually it took place throughout the district. So we're just happy to have our partners that support us. Again, I think Makai mentioned this earlier. We're so excited to see that track at Ken Island High School. It is very nice. I can't wait to get out to see it in person. Um, it looks so nice pictured there, so I just can't wait to see it. A special thank you to our county commissioners and our very own Board of Education members for supporting this effort. So thank you so much. Also, again, you can see there Ken Island staff. Um, they actually participated participated in staff training as well. Ken Island High School's marching band hosted their first home marching band competition in over 15 years. The Buccaneers competed in the Maryland Marching Band Association circuit. So congratulations to the marching band of Ken Island High School. There you can see homecoming. I think we talked about that earlier, Austin. I can see that you all had your school pride going on and congratulations on a successful homecoming. So we're just happy about the homecoming event over at Queen Anne's High School. And now Queen Anne's County Public School goes purple. We had that last month. And here we go. Staff at schools and central office show their Go Purple Pride during the month of September. We want to thank Mr. Schiffinelli for joining us and supporting the Purple Pride in Queen Anne's County Public Schools. So thank you, Mr. Schiffinelli. Right on. <laughs> and here you can see scenes of the Queen Anne's County Goes Purple events. So a lot going on here, lots of activities. We had cheer, um, vendors, just food. Um, it was just a great activity to go to or event to go to. And it's just, it's just great to support that effort. So you can see all those different scenes there. Constitution Day was celebrated in a variety of ways throughout our school system. And you can see some of the pictures there throughout our school system in our schools. And we'd like to thank our community partners for their support. And that concludes our spotlight for the month of September. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're at our citizen participation and public comment. We ask all speakers to keep in mind the following guidelines. Speakers should sign the roster, including their telephone number and address. Comments should be limited three minutes in length. Comments longer than three minutes should be submitted in writing. Questions or statements to the board should relate to a matter of general policy over which the board has authority. Comments about actions or statements of individual staff members are not appropriate for public comment and should be referred to the superintendent of schools or board president. If you have a specific question, the board will make sure an appropriate staff member responds to your question. The board respects your desire and right to convey your message freely, but ask as a courtesy to this board and our citizens to show respect for all. First name on the list, Richard McNeil. We got a new time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting. Good evening, everybody. Um, Richard McNeil, and I represent myself and the uh, retired school personnel of the, of the county. And uh, it's great to be here tonight. A uh, couple of comments that I'd like to make uh, for us and for everything going out. Um, 
This Saturday is a celebration of life of one of our past members, uh, Bill Malaski. Uh, Bill was a wonderful uh, industrial arts teacher, uh, tech ed when it changed over it's at uh, Stevensville. Um, he was one of those individuals that just brought a smile every single day when you met him. And uh, he touched the lives of a lot of a lot of children. So that'll be out at Conquest Beach at 12 o'clock this coming Saturday. And the weather's supposed to be sunny. So we'll have that. Um, for our uh, organization, we have our fall October meeting this coming Wednesday instead of Tuesday uh, for location. And uh, we're looking forward to that. Um, at it's going to be held at um, uh, Centerville uh, United Methodist Church uh, starting at 1130, lunch at 12. Um, and um, we have asked our members, they have to bring a field trip slip because we're going out to the one-room schoolhouse afterwards uh, to kind of uh, open that up and uh, so people can uh, see that. Our last opening for the year was this past Saturday. It's closed until next May. So uh, we're going on a field trip and uh, we're got permission from the high school to be able to park there and, and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, I'd like to uh, just mention uh, our group is also supporting the ALS walk for the county, which will be um, October 23rd. Uh, one of our former teachers and guidance counselors uh, has been um, how do you say, impacted by ALS. So uh, the county is uh, getting behind her and the organization. So if you could help out on that, that would be great. Uh, it starts at nine o'clock. Um, interesting. Um, I don't know who in the board has the, his, the history of all the superintendents and the time frame. And if not, we need to suggest that we get that going. A little bit of a history um, of, uh, coming from the old schoolhouse. In 1867, there was eight schools in the county for white students only. In 1869, there was eight students for white students and four, four uh, schools for Afro-American students. Um, in 1875, there were eight schools with 672 students. Teachers were paid $25 a month. In 1884, this had gone up to nine schools with just under 800 students. Um, so if, if, you, if we can get the superintendents and all the uh, history, I don't know where it is, but it's got to be somewhere in here. Okay, and one last thing. Um, been to Queen Anne's High School for a lot of the sporting events, not because I don't go to Ken Island, I'm just up here. It's great to see the enthusiasm back in the schools mm -hmm. for everything, especially sports and, and the drama and all like that. I think the COVID kind of put a damper on a lot of that for a while. But this year, what I have seen so far, it just brings a, a good feeling about our students. They're just they're just doing great yep. um, not only on the sports fields but in the academics also okay. so uh, i applaud everybody who's uh, doing that and thank you thank you, thank you. Mr. Thank you. it's always thank a pleasure you. sir it's the only name on our list anyone else like to speak all right thank you so much moving on uh 6.01 school safety update lieutenant meal from the sheriff's office and mr joe sobory sobory sorry <laughs> That's my cup of The former student. There you go. Oh, yeah. Stories? Uh, later. <laughs> <laughs> Off camera. It's called detention. That's what they say. It. Good evening, gentlemen. Thank you for joining us. Good evening. No, please. Lieutenant Mark Meal from the Queen Anne's County Sheriff's Department, the Sports Services Division Commander. Um, on behalf of Sheriff Hoffman and the entire staff of the Queen's County Sheriff's Office, we want to thank the Superintendent Salians and the Board of Education members for having us here again this evening for a security update. The DARE program is currently in session with Bayside and Graysonville Elementary Schools. It's going very well from what I've been informed. 
Uh, the school bus camera enforcement program, known as Bus Patrol, is running efficiently uh, from August 29th, 22 until 9:30, 22. Our office has reviewed 151 violations. We approved 86 citations for enforcement. From August 30th, 21 to July 29th, 22, our office reviewed 944 violations, while we approved for enforcement 453 citations. For this current calendar year, from January 1st, 22, until October 3rd, 22, our office reviewed 623 violations while approving for enforcement 321 citations. And that's approximately a 52% approval rating. Uh, you may ask that why is the difference in approval versus unapproved? Some were administrative reasons, some were they weren't valid citations, the bus driver didn't operate the equipment properly, those kind of things we take into account. Um, our office continues to provide and maintain a comprehensive security operations response plan for every school, including private institutions, daily to ensure the safety and welfare of all students, faculty and staff. We take these responsibilities very seriously. We are very fortunate to live, work and play in one of the safest counties in the state of Maryland. We're very thankful for that. And it's due to all of our, everyone's involvement. Uh, our agency has recently been approved for five additional resource deputy positions uh, by the county commissioners for school security coverage. So we're gonna be increasing our numbers. It's very much needed and we appreciate that. Uh, they will provide more flexibility for personnel, for staffing levels and assignments. Uh, do you have any questions about anything I've discussed? Yes. Are the numbers going up or are they going down? They are going up since the inception of the program. Um, including summer school, so the buses run during summer school as well, and we generate citations whenever the buses are running for school functions. We have an idea of why they're going up. Uh, you have a lot of transient traffic over the summer. You know, people coming through the county that don't live here may not know about the program. Um, it's education. We're pushing the word out to the community. Uh, you know, we, we don't have a repeat offender list that much anymore. We have a few. In the beginning, we had a, a larger list of repeat offenders, but the word is getting out. Uh, I just think there's more traffic on the road. If you remember when we started this program, it was during COVID. Mm -hmm. So there wasn't much traffic on the road at that time. Now, they're, everyone's going back to their lives and they're going to work and they're traveling and they're driving. So uh, that, that gets part of the, the reason for the increase. Do some of the um, citations also include people being on their phone? I mean, are, are they catching them being on their phone as well as, you know, not watching just no, not the bus? No, the, the citations are generated by the red flashing lights okay, that's, on so the bus. Okay, so there's no other... If, if we are able enough to see closely enough inside the vehicle, we may be able to pick up a phone violation. And that's further, you know, investigative on our part. I only ask because I'm wondering why people don't see a stop bus. You'd be surprised. That's not the big <laughs> see. It, it, it. People try to beat it. It's like a red light. They try to beat the yep. the, the lights being activated in the stop sign. Mm -hmm. So uh, we just ask that people pay attention, slow down, let the children get on and off the buses sa safely. That's the main thing. Well, I mean, thank you. And it must be so time consuming to look through all of those uh, uh, all that film. But I have a question about the payments. When we're paying the company, do they get paid for approvals um, only? Do they get paid for a number of um, violations? Like how, how do they get their money for putting those cameras on the buses? I think that part comes under the Board of Education, MOU, where they're paid a, a certain amount for all the equipment on the buses. And there's an administrative fee that's paid by the Board of Education to the vendor directly. So what we have exactly, um, when we went with Bus Patrol, we were able to put cameras on every single bus. Um, a lot of other companies were looking solely for just ones that had high runner rates. We felt as a county that, you know, every bus deserved one with every student that was on it. Um, with that being said, we were able to also put new cameras on inside the bus um, so we could have a, a better system. Ours was had met the end of its life. Um, the money generated, it, it is a revenue sharing, but a county our size will never meet that fee. I shouldn't say never. It will probably never reach that fee of coming back to us. Um, but 
um, larger counties like PG County that produce more, um, you know, that revenue split basically 60-40 between bus patrol and, um, you know, the Board of Ed, or it could go to the Sheriff's Department or PG County Police Department. Um, the concept was if we ever got to that point that we could put the money we made back into school safety, um, you know, with other programs. But again, you know, the technology fee that is associated with this, you know, is highly unlikely we'll see anything come back to us. We're just a smaller county that, you know, can't generate, we don't, not that we want to generate that many, but no, we don't. Um, it's actually kind of scary, I think, that if we're looking at a fairly small county like Queen Anne's and this is happening daily, mm. you know, multiply that times all the jurisdictions in the state of Maryland, I mean, it's, that's 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 pretty scary to me. So it's just based, though, on the, the revenue brought in from the actual um, approved that's correct. Violations. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. That's no, no, correct. no. It's okay. Just making sure we weren't having to spend all their time and then no. we're paying for. And the some of them, as uh, Lieutenant said, we're educating the bus drivers of, hey, you weren't fully stopped when you activated your red lights, so that disqualifies that stop. I mean, they have to be fully stopped, and you know, we've had an education part of our own, so. We've had training for the bus drivers and, and through the vendor bus patrol as well as us being involved with the training as well. So it's it's a continuous educational effort uh, when they have turnover and new bus drivers coming in, we have to retrain them. And, but uh, the statute for the state of Maryland has specific requirements for the citation to be a valid citation. And if they don't follow those guidelines in that stat statute, then we pick up on that and we'll, we'll you know not approve it. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Chipinelli? Oh, no. no. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I always hate getting partnered up with him because he's always so prepared and organized. So it's, it's like <laughs> I should have went and first. We're very grateful. Actually, when he offered that. <laughs> so I'm about three, three and a half weeks in, and good evening, everybody. Uh, three and a three and a half weeks into acclimating to the um, coordinator of school safety and security. Uh, when I retired from the state police, I always thought I'd find myself in a job where I would maybe not be busy. Um, and this certainly is not one of those. Uh, we've really hit the ground running. Um, with some uh, incidents that we've looked into uh, and I've spent uh, a good portion of the last three weeks conducting uh, school visits and tours of different school campuses and getting face time with all of the uh, administrative staff and the SROs at each of the schools. Um, and this tour uh, will continue through the month of October. Um, and so it's important to me to understand uh, coming into this what what their priorities are, what their safety and security priorities are, uh, so that you know, hopefully, we can get them addressed in a timely manner. Um, I've participated in several of their drills, from fire drills to reverse evacuation, evacuation, and lockdown drills, and I'm very pleased to say that. Um, Pre-COVID, when we were really going school to school and, and doing a lot of teaching, um, a lot has improved, and I and I could. Uh, it, it's a really great feeling for me to come back uh, and to witness these drills. And, and I've sat in the classrooms when we've locked them down to to have that set of lenses, uh, and and I've just been so incredibly impressed with where we are right now, with with um, how we're how we're uh, responding to these drills and and how seriously the staff at these schools are taking these drills. So that's very comforting. Um, there's going to come a point where I'm going to continue uh, to look at some of our current safety and security policies uh, and hopefully make some recommendations um, uh, to, to some of those policies. Um, this has also been a great opportunity to strengthen the relationships that we have with our uh, emergency services and our law enforcement partners. Uh, and what I realize is is that we cannot do this without them. Uh, and, and the relationships that we have with the sheriff's office and the police department and the state police and emergency services, uh, I know they've been out just about every day probably for the last four, four weeks or more uh, doing a lot of great uh, uh, lessons and, and teaching at the school. So uh, they're to be commended. Um, and so I'm looking forward to really kind of continuing to um, 
absorb and consume and digest um, the different needs at each school because each one is different uh, and hopefully um, you know, create some great ideas on how we can continue to keep our, our staff, students, and visitors safe. Uh, and I'll just finally say, I don't know how Mr. Pender was able to balance this job and the, and the other jobs that he has. Uh, it, it is just truly unbelievable. I have an office across the hall from him, and I, I don't know how he finds time to get any of his own stuff done because he's always jumping up out of his chair to help somebody else out. So um, just kudos to him for... Uh, the job that he does every day. So I'll have more for you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you for joining yes, us. Ma'am. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Um, 6.02 Capital Improvement Program, uh, Mrs. Pullen and Mr. Pinder. Good evening, Vice President Harper, members of the board, Dr. Salins and executive team. My name is Carla Pullen, facilities planner, Queen Anne's County Public Schools. And I'm here this evening to give you a quick overview of our fiscal year 2024 capital improvement plan requests to the state of Maryland. CIP is what you'll hear it called throughout the presentation and probably moving forward. Let's try this. We'll just go slide like that. So I'm going to outline for you what the CIP is, how we calculate how much state funding we're eligible for, what happens when in this process, and what our requests are going to be to the state this year. So this slide might look a little bit familiar. We talked about this back in June with our educational facility master plan. So this is a two-step process. The first part of requesting state funding is that educational facility master plan that really looks at our facilities, it looks at our needs, it looks at our enrollment, and then we start to project out what we're going to need in the future in our buildings and facilities. The second part of this is the capital improvement plan. That's the funding piece. So we're looking at what we need this year, we're looking at what we're gonna need in future years, and we're establishing that timeline for us and for the state. We prioritize projects on a state level by their age, by the building condition, and more recently by the capacity. The state is starting to look at capacity and educational sufficiency to be able to house all of our programs. To be eligible to get state funding, we have to have a project that is $200,000 or more. And if it is not that large of a project, then typically it's something that we're asking for funding from the local government only. If you recall, this is all part of COMAR, the Educational Facilities Master Plan, as well as our CIP, and this is just the area in the law that states exactly what we need to do every year. The Educational Facility Master Plan helps us come up with the cost share formula. So with our Educational Facility Master Plan, we look at participation in state programs from our county, we look at free and reduced lunch percentages, we look at our unemployment rate, the per capita income, our population growth, and that allows the state to set a percentage of how much funding they are going to give us each year. We are at 51%, which means the county pays 49 percent of our projects we have had no change from last year and we anticipate that we'll probably remain at this rate for the next few years how is our funding calculated? Well, for large systemic projects and or newer renovation projects, we look at the enrollment of that particular building over a seven year period. We're extending out seven years. The state gives us a square footage number that's to be allotted per student. So that gives us the eligible building size. That is what the state says we should be able to sufficiently house programs in. That's our eligibility at the state level. They take that project building size. They also allot to us a per a cost per square foot that will be allotted each year based on typical construction rates in Maryland. And that gives us the eligible construction costs. There's a, there's a formula that the state uses to tell us how much we should be getting per project. 
with our schedule, Educational Facilities Master Plan goes in in July. The Capital Improvement Plan, which we're talking about tonight, goes in in October. And then we don't start talking with the county government until the beginning of next year about what these capital projects will look like. So the state's budget timeline a little bit ahead of where we are with the county. For construction purposes, the money becomes available to us on July 1st. So we are talking now about the money that will be available to us in July of 2023. And for planning and design, we typically start talking one to two years in advance of when the construction projects are gonna start. This is the slide everybody wants to see. I gave you a very large document. It's a couple, it's 160 some pages. It's all of the backup documentation that the state requires. Page 156 is this page. This tells us what the fiscal year 24 priorities are. So we will be looking at the Kent Island High School roof replacement. If you recall, we had funding for this secured from the state and the county previously. The bids came in too high, so we asked the state to put that into reserve for us. We are going to go back to the state and ask for $4.8 million. We will ask for a match from the county of about that much to equal a little bit over $9 million to complete that project. The state has recently started participating in design and planning and the costs associated with that, which is new to us and new to this county, but it's also a very good thing. Uh, before that was county only funding and they were essentially responsible for that. So the state is now participating. So what we are looking for is to start the design process for Centerville Middle School. You may recall we have some money from the county to do a feasibility study and to write our ed specs. This will allow us to roll right into the design and that will give us the consistency throughout that process to be able to figure out exactly what our recipe is for a great building, to figure out if it's going to be a new building or a renovation and then to go right into the design portion of that. The third project we have here for you this evening, Kennard Elementary School, we have a fire alarm replacement. We have been doing these types of systemic projects throughout our buildings for the last couple of years because they are at the end of their useful life. Kennard is a little over 20 years old with that fire alarm system. So we have some upgrades such as the voice evacuation system so that you can hear, not only see the strobes, um, and it will also help to fix some code issues as we upgrade grade this, we will now bring our pool stations down so they are to a more handicap accessible height. The other projects, this is not inclusive of everything that will be in our capital budget. This is just the projects that we are sending to the state because they are eligible for funding from the state. And we are always looking at these from a lens of life safety, the building envelope, and what needs are there, our capacity at each of the buildings, the energy efficiency, and what systemic replacements need to happen. So with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions and then I'll be back in a little bit to see if you will approve this for us as a working document for fiscal year 24. Anyone have any questions? Thank you so Very much. Good. Thank, Thank you. you. Six point oh three blueprint update, Dr. Kibler. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Is that up? Good evening, uh, Vice President Harper, Dr. Salins, board members and executive team, uh, Dr. Matt Kibler, Director of Accountability. Uh, so I come to you tonight just to give a, a talk through a little bit of an update um, on the blueprint and where we are in the state and planning here in the district. Um, slides just kind of background really. Um, just as a reminder, I feel like anytime we start talking about it, I just keep in mind what the policy areas that are now being called the pillars by the accountability board. Um, we have early childhood education, the high quality and diverse teachers and leaders, college and career readiness, which is also encompasses the um, CTE piece, more resources for students to be successful and then um, governance and accountability. 
Uh, just want to talk a little bit tonight about where we are with the comprehensive implementation plan of the blueprint, some general updates, and then talk a little bit specifics around pre-K. Uh, so first off, this was the original implementation plan for the blueprint when it was first passed in uh, 2020, the spring of 2021, which the plan was going to be due last year in June. You might remember we talked a little bit last spring, this House Bill 1450, it delayed the comprehensive implementation plan by roughly nine months. And we're a little bit at the beginning of these new dates. Uh, on September 1st, uh, the Maryland State Department of Education had to report to the Accountability and Im Implementation Board how the grading criteria for the district's implementation plans. So they did meet that date. The criteria was just presented publicly last week um, to the AIB by MSDE. So we got to see it for the first time. So we're still kind of all trying to digest um, what's there. It has not been approved um, yet. So we're still waiting to hear what the AIB thinks of that. There's going to be some public comment around it. So we're kind of <laughs> right in that limbo stage. Dr. Kibler, just for reference for people in the audience that don't know sure. AIB. So the Accountability Implementation Board um, was set by the, by the legislature and then the governor appointed them to oversee the implementation of the blueprint. So you kind of think of the AIB almost being above MSDE in this case, because it is more than just MSDE. There's some higher education pieces to it, government and, um, and other things. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Um, by December 1st, the AIB has to release what they want the comprehensive plans to look like. And then by March 15th, we, we will have to submit that plan. We have been told that in the middle of October, the AIB is going to go public for the first time with a draft of the comprehensive plan so that we can start talking about it as local education agencies give feedback, talk about what seems feasible, any changes we might recommend. Recommend to have a little bit of time. Um, it's gonna be interesting to see how that plays into what MSDE proposed for the criteria and how those two things go together. It's still a lot of wait and see, which is frankly pretty frustrating right now when we think that this whole decades long plan has to be written by March of this year, and we don't really know what all we have to write yet, but that's where we're at, and um, and we're gonna do the best, best we can. There are some conversations going on right now about um, sort of a staggered approach to the comprehensive plan that was initiated by MSDE. The AIB is kind of tossing it around as well, where rather than by March, us having to have a 10 year plan for the district submitted, maybe we could do that a little bit staggered, talk about phasing it a little bit. Um, I, I welcome that approach. Um, we don't, there's a lot of good things in here for kids, for our students, but at the same time, we don't wanna rush this and lock, them, lock ourselves into something that we can't change. So more to come, but I just wanna kinda let you know where we're at. Again, I did share this last spring, but just wanted to remind you all where we are. And just now that some of the MSDE and AIB guidance is slowly starting to be released, I'll let you know, and this is just an AIB graphic and we are right there in that public comment piece, the October, December timeline. Some general updates, uh, strategy that we'd like to go with here in Queen Anne's County when it comes to uh, writing the comprehensive plan is forming committees for each of the policy areas. So you'll, you'll remember that we had sort of a, a big umbrella blueprint advisory group last year, but as it comes time to starting to actually work on the five pillars, uh, we'll break off into some smaller committees. That is a model that many districts in the state are following. This was really successful when we talked last year about our pre-K expansion. So I'm hopeful that this will be a good strategy um, for the other uh, pillars as well. And again, we're still really in a wait and see. We're, now that the timeline delay didn't delay the other pieces of the blueprint necessarily. So we are still working on some of the pieces as they come up, but um, as soon as we get that guidance, we'll, we'll keep, um, keep going forward. Uh, I, I do lead uh, the other Eastern Shore counties, the blueprint coordinators, we meet monthly so that we all are roughly staying on the same page and we can kind of be a stronger voice when it comes to talking across the state. 
Um, so we had our first meeting of the year last week, and um, that's been that's been a great resource. I talked to another coordinator today. I had a, another county reach out. They want to talk tomorrow. So it's kind of nice that we're sort of all in it together. Um, it's really helpful. And then there's two statewide meetings every month that I go to. One, it's kind of just all the coordinators in the state, as well as one hosted by MSDE. AIB representatives are there. So it's really helpful. Again, there is a bit of frustration with this too, as it's like, well, this, we're still waiting for more information and we need more guidance, but um, we're sort of all in it together. And then lastly, I wanted to talk a little bit. One, one of the pillars that we did really start to move forward with last year with the blueprint is the pre-K expansion. So that is one of the pillars, the early childhood education. And that's really talking about expanding access to pre-K in public schools throughout this, well, in private providers throughout the state of Maryland. Um, one thing that people think of, there's a misconception out there, we've talked about this before, is that that's universal pre-K. Universal pre-K applies that everybody just is guaranteed a spot. Everybody that wants to go to pre-K can go to pre-K. And that's not the reality. This is not a mandate to have enough spots for every, every child in the district. Uh, it's really about expanding access to pre-K. We did present a three-year plan last year to have all six of our elementary schools offering full-day pre-K, so we're really excited about that. We have the two additional schools doing that this year. That's Mattapique Elementary and Graysonville, so now we have four of the six up to full day. Um, and, and so then we have, we'll add Ken Island Elementary School next year, hopefully, which a little tie into the next comment, and then uh, Centerville Elementary School in the, in the third year of that. One thing that's interesting about uh, pre-K with this expansion under the blueprint, the funding for it works differently than it does for our K-12 students. Funding for our K-12 students is tied to whether or not uh, families enroll their children in school, and then we get funding based on whether or not they come to school. For pre-K, the funding is tied directly to household income. And this is a very new thing for our families not just in Queen Anne's County, but all across the state. And we are getting pushback from families um, about wanting to share their household income because it's, it's so different and it's not something that people are used to. Um, so funding for students is based on 300% of the poverty level for the household size. Um, that would be full funding for a student. And then there's a sliding scale for the next tier, 300, 600% of the um, federal poverty level for funding. Really, the success of pre-K expansion and our ability to offer the program is completely tied to um, collecting that household income information. Uh, so we're going to keep pushing for it. Um, but just wanted you all to be aware that we are getting pushback from community members. We'll need your support if we're going to continue to expand this program. And the reality is, if we don't have funding, um, it's going to be really difficult to continue doing this in the district. Dr. Kibler, can you um, elaborate on who sees that information and where does it go? Sure. So um, the information is collected by, at the schools. Uh, everybody has a point of contact. It's basically, it's either the, the Judy centers in our schools that have the Judy centers that are collecting that information, or it's usually um, a lead secretary at the school is collecting that information. They share it. There's one, um, there's one or two people here in the central office then that sees it, that collects it, because we have to produce the letters here of who's, who's in and who's out um, of the program. And, and that's it. I mean, it's, it's, it's just a handful of, of folks that are eligible. And then um, somebody from my office that puts the, the data file for September attendance that goes to the state for the funding, we'll see it. But it's a very small number of, of individuals. We treat it with the utmost security, just like all of our information that we, that we keep on, on students and families. And as it relates to the 300% poverty level, um, can you just maybe take that a step further so that parents can understand um, what does that income look like maybe for, sure. for an example? Sure. So I don't, I didn't bring a chart of what the actual income level or what the poverty levels are for, for 2022, but, but an example would be, let, let's say hypothetically that this year, and this is, this is a roundabout, a household of four people. 
Uh, the federal poverty level for this year is somewhere around $30,000, I believe. Um, so what that means with the 300% threshold, multiply that by three. So that household, if they make um, below $90,000, um, they would qualify for that full funding level. When you increase that, the sliding scale where we get partial funding, that would mean that same family of four, household of four, if they make under the $180,000 mark, we would still receive partial funding um, for those students. So somebody who may think, I make entirely too much money, would not understand necessarily that we could still get partial funding for that student. Exactly. So Comar right now says that we do have to provide at least a half a day program for families that are below the 185% threshold. And I think in a lot of folks in our community, especially if they've had older kids go through um, or had ever applied, they're, they're under that assumption that I know I don't qualify. I was told before I would never be anywhere close to qualifying. But these expanded numbers, a lot more people are um, under those thresholds than, than before. And then my last question for you, what could you, or comment would be, could you please explain why Centerville Elementary School is the last school in that three-year process? Sure. So maybe I'll start with, with all of them, if, if that's OK. Sure. Absolutely. So, so we went. Um, sort of based on, on need a little bit at first. So Graysonville, one of our Title I schools, had, had was getting a Judy Center this year, had the space, had the need in the community, um, made sense to expand to the four-day programs there. Mattapique was only up, Mattapique had the space, was only offering one classroom of a half a day program. So it was not, is not much to um, expand that to a full day there. Um, next year with Ken Island, they have some empty spaces. So again, um, we'll be able to expand slowly in, in that elementary school as well. Unfortunately, with Centerville Elementary School, uh, it's our biggest school other than our high schools. It's bigger than all the middle schools. So space is definitely an issue there. And with expanding uh, pre-K at Centerville, we just have to figure out where we're going to put the students. Um, if we didn't the only way to do it without adding something like a portable or doing or doing some sort of expansion to the building would be to cut the number of students we're serving at that school right now. And we certainly don't want to do that, especially because we have to stay in compliance with Comar still with the 185 and the half day programs. So really expanding to Centerville, that's delayed to that third year to buy us time to figure out what we can do about space, what's going to be best um, for the students and to work with Mr. Pender's team to figure out how we can accommodate. Thank you so much. I guess the moral of the story is please apply and make sure that you provide the necessary information so that we can include um, as many pre-K students as possible. That's right. We're really excited about it. The schools, the schools love it. Uh, I have talked to some families that, you know, with the expanded access have, have gotten to take advantage of it. They're so excited. The principals, like I heard from a couple of the principals, like the first week they were sending me pictures. Hey, we've got full day pre-K yeah. down here. Yeah. So everybody's really excited about it, but we can only keep doing it um, if we get that. So and I don't know if anybody has any questions about any of the... Anyone? Questions? No, thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Let's hope for good things. Yeah, to thanks. Happen. Thank you, sir. 6.04 expenditure status reports. Ms. Towers. Good evening, Vice President Harper, Dr. Salins, board members, executive team. My name is Jane Tower, CFO for Queen Anne's County Public Schools. Tonight we bring before you the expenditure status report in detail and in summary for your review. Are there any questions on these? Um, please note that we'll be bringing a budget amendment on our workshop on the 19th. Okay. Should I go on to the next one? Sure. Any questions? Anyone? Next, we have the COVID report. We have ESSER 2. 
wrapping it up on 930 of 23 is the expenditure date as well as ESSER 3 and that extends to 930 24. See on answer two that there's no nursing equipment on this particular. Yeah, the answer two. Answer two was some nursing supplies. Yes. Yes. To supply in the um, different health rooms, and it's not there now. At, on answer two. It was actually it's spent out in okay. answer two. Okay. Thank with you. a little bit of overage, under supplies. Got it. Thank you. Of course. Anyone else? We're good. Thank you, ma'am. I oh, appreciate you. it. Uh, we're supposed to have a break now. Is it all right with everyone if we keep moving on? Mm -hmm. Sure. It's fantastic. 8.01, Human Resource and Substitute Bus Driver Report. Do I have a motion to accept as presented? Motion to accept the HR report as presented. Second. Motion uh, and second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. The Capital Improvement Program, 8.02, Ms. Pullen. Good evening once again. I'm here to ask for your approval of the fiscal year 2024 CIP document as a working document for submission to the state. This includes three projects. This will be a request to the state for $4.8 million for the Ken Island High School roof replacement, $1.8 million for Centerville Middle School design and planning, $1.4 million for Kennard Elementary School fire alarm replacement. Any questions or comments? Do I have a motion to approve the fiscal year 2024 uh, CIP program submission to the state with no I'm sorry, program? I just had a real quick question. I thought, sure, thank you. Isn't it the state that does 51% and we do 49? That's correct. So then why is the state's less? If there is some planning funding that's in there or design that we haven't asked the state to fund, there are some ineligible costs, then it does put our percentage just a little bit over okay. on the county Thanks. side. Thanks. Sorry about that. That's a good no, question. No, no, it's a good question. And uh, thank you for catching that. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Pullen, for describing it. Yes. So do I have a motion? Motion to accept. Um, Whatever you just presented, Ms. Okay. Pullen. <laughs> so moved. And second. 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 Okay, I have a motion. Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Thank, Thank you. you. Good luck. I'm here for another one. <laughs> Bye, Do you still have to go for the bag? The bag <laughs> yes. in January? Yes. Hold, go at going at Begathon and ask for money? And I think that, for the most part, has been eliminated. There. Thank yes. goodness. Mm -hmm. that, was, yes. that was very degrading. Yes. Okay. So the fire alarm replacement at Sellersville Elementary School? Yes. So I ask your approval for a contract with JPI, JCI Simplex to replace the fire alarm system and the associated components at Sellersville Elementary School. This is a source well cooperative cooperative purchasing contract. We will be replacing the system with full, vo full voice evacuation, as I mentioned earlier. Um, it helps us to bring this up to current code as well as to all of the new technologies. We are asking for contract amount of $193,557,000 with a 5% contingency for any unforeseen conditions. So the total fiscal dollar amount is $203,234.85. Any questions? So I have a motion to approve the contract? Uh, I uh, move to approve the request for the, sorry, I have to move up here and read this, for the fire alarm replacement at Suffersville Elementary School in the amount of $203,234.85 um, with budget source uh, fiscal year 2023 state capital funding of $98,714.07 and a fiscal year 2021 county capital funding amount of $104,520.78. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and second. Any questions or comments on the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote on the motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Thank, Thank you, you very Ms. much. Pullen. Thank you for joining us. Uh, 8.04, the ESMEC blended virtual program. Ms. Towers. 
I think I'm going to go ahead and take the lead on You're going to take the lead yes, but, but I will default to her if, if necessary. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so uh, Vice President Harper and members of the board, I'm uh, coming to you this evening with the purpose of uh, funding for 29 seats through our ESMEC blended virtual program known as the BBP, which was started during COVID. Um, so we have a seat licenses with them. Um, these are to serve students with a high quality and engaging coursework. Um, it is all approved by MSDE. It involves synchronous and asynchronous instruction um, with certain guidelines uh, for that as well. Um, those students, please remember, are still involved and enrolled in Queen Anne's County Public Schools, are still eligible to participate in any curricular activities or athletic programs. Um, they are our students. Um, the total physical impact is $202,000, 800 um, but really we have to remember that uh, these we pay by seat. Right. Each seat costs us $7,500, but we are reimbursed by the state for right around $15,000. So it's about half of that money comes back to the district. Um, so it's not the total impact is really about half of what you see here um, as it relates to funding all the way around. And budget so. source is unrestricted. Yes, yeah, state, state aid. aid. Thank you. Thank, thank you. So we have 29 seats, but how many students do we actually have enrolled? 29, I believe we had, yeah, 29, okay. we had little, many little, we had to have a cutoff date. We did have a waiting list. Mm -hmm. And then I think we, I think we had like one drop out and one go in, and then we had one drop out and one go in. And so we were able to, I think, limit right now. We've, we've cut it off to my knowledge. We don't have a waiting list, okay. um, but I'm sure we'll be gearing up for second semester because we inevitably will have different. Um, and, and honestly, um, I approved seats as we went up through the process um, because for that very matter, if it's a good match for a student mm -hmm. to make them successful, um, it, it certainly doesn't negatively impact the district. So um, we're pretty flexible. Anyone else? Do I have a motion? I motion uh, make the motion to approve the ESMEC blended virtual program in the amount of $202,800, which is source unrestricted state aid. We have a motion, I have a second. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any questions or comments on the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote on the motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it, the motion is carried. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, 9.01, citizen participation. Anybody wanna talk? Mm, no, okay. Uh, future meetings and events. Um, Wednesday, October 19th at five o'clock, we have our work session. November 2nd, 2022, we'll have our uh, open session starting at six o'clock uh, and an executive closed session is at 4.30. Does anyone have anything else for the good of the cause? Am I in time? Yes. <laughs> yeah, your three minutes are up. The Come on. Timer said so. <laughs> he was trying to put it away. That was funny. <laughs> Nothing else. So for uh, just for past history, Dave Brown always said great things are happening in Queen Anne's County. I'd like to adjourn this meeting. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, QAC TV. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Do we have second. it? Motion oh. second. Any questions or comments? You got it. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. The ayes have it. Have a good evening.